I mean, if you look back at the early stuff we did, the early Top Gear, it now looks quite old fashioned. Well, I mean, we look, we tend to look a bit old fashioned anyway. It looks old fashioned and it looks quite stilted because it is a long time ago. What first sparked your interest in cars and, and how did you kind of come to start talking about writing about them? Um, well, I, I mean, I was quite interested in them as a lad and I used to read car magazines, but we all did, to be honest, back then. And then I, I sort of fell into, I did a lot of jobs that were unsuitable for me, including working at the civil service, during which time I produced a brochure for schools on behalf of the Department of Trade and Industry. Don't ask me how that happened, it's just something that happened. And as a result of that, I blagged my way into a sub-editing job on a technical magazine, and then it went from there, and then there, a job came up on a car magazine, Autocar, which I applied for and got. But I was doing sort of production sub-editing. I didn't know anything about, you know, I'd never been into that sort of thing when I was young, and I didn't really know what I was doing. Uh, and I learned it as I went along. And then after being fired by quite a few places, I had to go at writing stuff, which again was something I'd never really done. Um, and then I was given a column on a car magazine and it, and it just sort of happened from there. There was no plan and there definitely wasn't any ambition. It's just, it's just what happened. When would you say you first became interested in travelling and exploring other cultures? Um, well, not as a child because we didn't really go abroad. Um, apart from that I went on the school German exchange, which I liked immensely and I'm still very good mates with the bloke I stayed with. I think it really started after I'd left university and I went into railing. So I did a bit of looking at things in Europe that I'd always been intrigued about in books, like um, Italian buildings and art galleries, bits of France, um, that sort of thing. And then early in my working life, I, would, I, I never really planned proper holidays with my mates because I was too disorganised. So occasionally I would go to a, there was a shop in Kilburn that sold what we used to call bucket seats, which were leftover flights on airlines. You could go in there and say, what have you got for 50 quid? And I ended up going to um, Croatia. I went back to Italy again. I went somewhere in Spain. And eventually I, I made friends with some people and I went to the States. And so I suppose it sort of comes from there, but it's not from childhood. In, in childhood, we went to the British seaside and British countryside, that sort of thing and I, I knew nothing. And how would you describe your experiences in India and how did they kind of compare to what you went through in Japan and Italy? Uh, well, they are three very different countries. Um, they don't really have anything in common, I wouldn't say, apart from you can eat very well in all of them. Uh, India I've been to before. I know that it's it, it can be a bit challenging if, if you're a... Uh, British or well, if you're a Westerner or a European, um, but it's not actually it's not actually as difficult as people imagine. Maybe it's it's easier these days, but I I find I find India just very very stimulating and exciting, and it's and it's just a sort of rather remarkable place to be, even if you're not doing anything in particular, just going about the the daily business of existing and eating your breakfast and going for a walk to the shops. It all becomes exciting in India because it's it's sort of slightly riotous but not in a not in a bad way it's just it's just exciting mm. and how would you kind of compare this trip to India compared to when you were there before well the, um, so when I've done it before I've either been on holiday or I've done we did India with Top Gear in the old days so that was that, that's a little bit more um, it's not scripted as such but it's a it's a bit more controlled because we're making a a sort of sitcom, really. This time, I, I suppose, I, I think I learned more in this trip about India than in all the previous ones combined, because I was sort of forced to by, by the nature of the job. So uh, this one had more variety and it was also more informative. How would you kind of describe your experience working with Jeremy Clarkson and Richard Hammond over the Terrible. years? Terrible. It's just awful, yeah. How do you think things have evolved between you, you three in this time? Well, I think, I mean, if you look back at the early stuff we did, the early Top Gear, it now looks quite old fashioned. Well, I mean, we, look, we tend to look a bit old fashioned anyway. It looks old fashioned and it looks quite stilted because it is a long time ago. It's, you know, it's over two decades and TV has changed a lot. I think we've probably got to a point now where 
I wouldn't, we don't quite know what the other one's going to say, but we've got a pretty good idea because we, we don't live in each other's pockets. We don't all live in a big house like some people imagine with all our cars parked outside. We have our, our separate lives, but when we're together making our specials and things, it's a, it's a pretty intensive, um, complete, immersive experience apart from when we're actually asleep, which we tend to do separately. Um, but the rest of the time we're together and in each other's pockets and getting on each other's nerves and in each other's hair. So yeah, I think I, I think I know them pretty well. Yeah. And what, do you feel like you've learned anything about presenting with your time with them? Yes. Uh, well, not just with them doing, doing the other things as well. I think, yeah, I didn't know anything about it when I started. There aren't really any instruction books or courses and I, I don't know that other TV presenters are particularly keen to share their secrets in the same way that chefs aren't or painters and decorators. I remember Quentin Wilson in, in, when I had my first false start on Top Gear in the Pebble Mill days, he was always very helpful. I've always loved Quentin for that. He used to say to me, Dude, Jeff James, relax, relax. You know, and he used to give me these little, because I was a complete beginner then. So uh, it's just, it, it is, again, it's something you learn as you go along, like everything else I've done. And I wonder, what were the movies that you loved as a kid, and do you kind of remember your first cinema trip? Uh, I'm not sure, we didn't go to the cinema that much when I was a kid. Um, I went to see a few, you know, Disney type things, or they may not have been Disney, but you know, kids things. The first, the first, big feature film I went to see was Battle of Britain in 1969 because I was already interested in aeroplanes so my dad took me to see it and I found it quite scary. I was only six years old. Uh, it's quite a big noisy film but I still watch it all the time because it has a, a special place in my heart. I, I did like things like that and I liked Where Eagles Dare and The Great Escape. I think later I became a bit more sophisticated so I watched Cinema Paradiso or some, you know, some art films and things, but I'm not, I'm not a movie buff. Mm -hmm. And what kind of were the TV obsessions you had growing up? Uh, well, it would have been largely the BBC because that was the only thing I was allowed to watch. That was, that was quite normal in British families back then. So I liked Tomorrow's World, the Burke special, anything with um, Brian Count and Derek Griffiths in, like Play Away. Um, I liked the Cold It series anything to do with sort of escaping or spying, anything like that. Um, what else did I used to, I used to watch some programs about music like the Oscar Peterson Piano Party. I used to watch that with my dad. Uh, watched The World at War, The Ascent of Man. You know, that was quite, quite bouncy stuff for a, for a young person. I, Claudius, I used to watch that with my mum because she loved it, so I used to watch it with her. Were there any mentors in your life or in your career that you feel had a defining impact on you? Um, well, apart from the obvious ones like, you know, some teachers and my parents and so on, there were, I mean, two, two people I have to thank, really, for the way things turned out were first John Pullen, who was the editor of The Engineer magazine. So that was the first magazine job I had after I got fired from the civil service. We used to get fired from everything. And I applied for the job as the sub-editor, not really knowing what I was doing. And he gave me the job. I remember ringing him up and pestering him, saying, I've applied for this job and I haven't heard. And eventually he said, right, come in for an interview. And to some extent, when I later got to know him, I realized that he, he actually hated interviewing people and he hated that process. And he, he met me and he decided I was okay, I think. So he gave me the job to get it over with. I think there was an element of that, but, or maybe he thought, Maybe he thought I had some promise, I don't know. But anyway, I, I sort of have to thank him for that, for being that first break. And then the second one is Gavin Green, who was the editor of Car Magazine, and gave me my first proper writing job because he said, come and write a column for Car Magazine. And again, that was a bit of a gamble on his part because I had no, uh, I had no previous, I had no track record. I, you know, I, I wasn't a journalist in any way, but I'd written a few columns in my spare time whilst working in production on magazines and I'd sent them to him. And getting a column on car magazine in those days was quite quite a plummy job. You know, people wanted that and they gave it to me for some reason. He gave it to me and that's sort of where the move into cars and then TV started. So I, I think those are the two who had the most, 
the, the greatest impact. If you could go back in time and give young James any advice on how to change his origin story, what would it be? I can't really remember now whether or not I worried about it, but I suspect I probably did. I'd go back and say, it'll be all right. And the other thing I would, I would do, and I, and I would do this, this is a bit of advice I'd give to young people, even though they should ignore it, um, is that you, you mustn't, you know, when you're, when you're a teenager, when you're in your 20s and you have, you know, that vitality of youth and, and the energy and the imagination, you, you mustn't do things that you don't really like doing. You mustn't do a job or be in a relationship or live in a house that you don't really like because you're wasting the most valuable bit of your life and it is pointless thinking you have to do something because that's what's expected of you or that's what you're supposed to do or that's what you are meant to do. I suffered from that. I thought there were things I, I, you know, I wouldn't have believed I was allowed to work in magazines or newspapers. I would have believed I was supposed to work in something quite square and quite administrative. And you shouldn't do that. I think I did waste some years of my life um, doing things that are fundamentally completely, I was, I was completely uninterested in them. And I would have been better off going and getting a job in a, in a vibrant bar or pub or shop or something where I met more people and, and had more interaction. You've, you've got to do, if, if, you, if you're not doing what you like, you will never be very good at it. You can only be good at things that, that inspire you. So whatever that is, do that. That's what I would have told me.